<laughs> welcome, welcome everybody here and afar. We thank you so much for joining us. And Elle, thank you also. I love that name, Elle. <laughs> anyway, uh, we so look forward to what's going to take place today, but to start us off, I could just offer a brief prayer and then we'll go. Let us pray. Dear and gracious Lord, we come to you today to learn and grow in our awareness and commitment to honoring all of your creation. Open our hearts to challenging and consciously working to end racial injustice. If something is new to us, let us listen with open hearts. And let us not forget God's commandment to love one another as he loves us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so with us today, we have Pastor L. Dowd. Um, Pastor L. uses pronouns like she, her, and hers. She is a Lutheran pastor, a graduate of the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, currently a student at Chicago Theological Seminary and the campus ministry, the campus minister of South Loop, South Loop Campus Ministry, and apparently I can't talk today. Um, so Elle has pieces of her heart in Sierra Leone, where her two children were born, and in St. Louis, where she learned from the radical queer Black leadership during the Ferguson uprising. Um, and uh, she writes about that in her recent book, Baptized in Tear Gas, um, telling a little bit about that story, her experience um, in Ferguson, and uh, learning from Black leadership. Um, she was formerly a co-conspirator with the movement to decolonize Lutheranism and currently serves as a board member of the Euro Descent Lutheran Association for Racial Justice and does community organizing in her in Chicago as a board member of um, an organization called Soul. Um, and mm -hmm. she regularly facilitates workshops like this one, both in church spaces and secular spaces. Um, and we are truly, truly blessed to learn with her today. So thank you so much for being here, Al. Thank you, Kathleen, for that introduction, and thanks um, for the opportunity, too, for reaching out, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to do that thing that we do now with Zoom and share my screen, and you can tell me if it actually works. Yeah. We're good? Okay. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk a little bit about building the world to come, building God's future, and how our own spiritual imagination as people created by God and in God's image and the spiritual imagination of those who came before us, our spiritual ancestors, can be an essential tool in bringing God's reign to earth. Kathleen did a little bit of this introduction, but if you're like me, a lot of times when there's like time for questions or discussion, all the like questions I had in my head just like fly out as soon as it's like, oh, we have about however many minutes for questions. Anyone have questions? So if you're also like me, maybe you think of those questions or ideas, you know, at two in the morning or in the shower three days later. So if that's true, you can feel free to reach out. These are some ways and places that you can get in touch with me. Um, but like Kathleen said, my name is Elle. I use pronouns like she, her, and hers. And uh, Baptizing Tear Gas, my book, which came out in August, is a book about my own conversion story from what Dr. MLK called the white moderate into a priest and police and prison abolitionist because of my time in the streets during the Ferguson uprising. So I had participated in some kind of like random protests or direct actions on and off throughout my life, but Ferguson was really transformational and it taught me a lot about movement building and it made me the person that I am today. I'm also uh, a mom. I'm a mom of two teenage daughters, Alice and Jessica. Alice is that little one with the megaphone and Jessica is in the jean jacket. And I think, you know, a lot of parents love sharing about their moms or there a lot of parents love sharing about their kids. Like lots of moms love to talk about their kids. Um, and I love sharing about them obviously because they're so beautiful and so brilliant. But I'm showing you this photo for another reason. I'm showing you this photo because a really essential part of changing the world is getting clear why it matters to you. So thinking about 
what will happen if the world doesn't change for you? What is at stake here? And there's a lot of ways that I could answer this question, but a big, big reason why I do what I do, a big part of what at stake for, is at stake for me is right here. I care about building a better world. I need a world beyond white supremacy because of my children. So when I tuck my kids in at night, I have to look at them, their beautiful eyes, and I have to like think about the reality of the world that they're going to wake up in in the morning. A world that has white supremacy baked into its very roots, a world that crushes both spirits and bodies, and a world that would rather see my children dead than set them free. I need more for them as their mom. And so the first step in making that happen is dreaming a little bit about what that might look like. So um, those of you who are online can feel free to put some ideas in the chat, but also in a minute here, we can have a second to kind of like popcorn around out loud for those of you who are in person. I'd love to hear when you hear like a phrase like spiritual imagination, what images or words or feelings come up for you? So if you're in the, if you're online, you can feel free to put some stuff in the chat. In person, feel free to like take a second to breathe and think about it and then go ahead and just like yell it out. Or pass a mic if you all have a mic over there. Just yell. MLK's beloved community. Yes, yes. I think of something yet to be. Yes. I see uh, no color difference, everyone the same. Mm -hmm. We're also just celebrating our differences too. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be a saint. We can't even celebrate our differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone's treated fairly. Everyone's treated with equality and also celebrating our differences. Yeah. Anyone else? One time I put, one time I was doing this workshop and someone put in the chats uh, church jargon and I was like, you're not wrong. Um, so spiritual imagination is a part of the creative process. Thank you so much for sharing your reflections on like initially what that phrase brings up for you. Spiritual imagination is part of the creative process and is a reflection of our creator. It's the courage to dream of something better in the face of a truly harsh reality. And it's the vulnerability to open ourselves up to believing that it might be possible despite the odds. And not like just that things would be like a little bit better, but that we could just crack everything open in order to imagine a world turned upside down, completely renewed. So like most creative endeavors, it's gritty and messy. It's rooted in stubbornness and resilience. Spiritual imagination is the boldness to proclaim the reality of and cast a vision for a future not yet realized. I'm going to let you in a little bit on some of the space that I inhabit, the space where my spiritual imagination runs wild. And if you're interested in hearing more about this and how I kind of like came to this place, again, you can pick up the book. But some of you might know that I am an abolitionist. So that means that I believe in and also work to build a world beyond policing and prisons and mass incarceration. But I didn't always feel that way. I didn't, I wasn't born an abolitionist. I wasn't raised in an abolitionist household. In large part, I wasn't always this way because I didn't actually like know that that was a possible thing. Like I didn't know what abolition was. Um, the abolitionists that I met during my time in Ferguson were the ones who taught me how to dream. They taught me that better worlds are possible. They taught me how to imagine a world and a future that I couldn't quite see yet. 
a few of the sort of what we might call architects of the modern abolitionist movement have things to say about this. Um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who's a black woman, who's one of the architects of the, of the abolition movement tells us, abolition is about presence, not absence. Which means that you hear the word abolition, you think of getting rid of stuff, right? Like abolition, getting rid of slavery. And so abolition is about getting rid of things like our criminal punishment system or prisons or policing. But even more than getting rid of that stuff, it's actually about building a world where all people have what they need and everyone can thrive. So put another way, Dr. Angela Davis, who is another architect of the abolition movement said, abolition is not primarily a negative strategy. It's not primarily about dismantling or getting rid of, it's about re-envisioning and building anew. And once I allowed myself to dream, I actually found that spiritual imagination was part of my inheritance as a Christian. In Jesus's first sermon in his ministry as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, if you all are on the revised uh, common lectionary, you heard this in church just a couple weeks ago, but in Jesus's first sermon in ministry, Jesus kind of shares with the people what he's all about. It's kind of like his like mission statement. And in that statement, Jesus says that he has come to set the captives free. All throughout our sacred scripture from beginning to end, we see our spiritual ancestors saying over and over and over where they envision a coming kingdom of God where people are not in cages and that everyone has what they need from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between. God thinks of being a liberator so much as part of God's identity that God almost like gives themselves a nickname about it saying, I am the Lord, your God, who led you out of captivity in Egypt. Like that's who I am. God is telling us that liberating captives is central to God's identity. So the prophets like Isaiah, who Jesus was quoting and the prophets today in our streets are really chanting about the same things. There is a part of us, and sometimes it's really dim because the world has stamped it out, but there is a part of us inside that knows that people are made to be free. And so if we believe our biblical heroes and that love wins and God wins, we know that there will be one day everything that Jesus promised in its fullness. There will be a release for captives. And we are invited here and now into the opportunity of being a part of making this happen. So this is a activity actually I learned from abolitionists that we're gonna partake in in a minute. Um, it's an exercise where we try to imagine another world. So we ask things like, when we reach freedom, how will we know? What will it smell like, feel like, taste like? So I want, you to take a minute in silence and just think for a little bit um, about this and be bold and be brave and take a risk to dream. Um, kind of the more audacious and specific, the better. If you notice these questions are really incarnational or really embodied questions, they're sensory questions. Like what does it smell like when we reach freedom, right? So think about stuff that's big, but the everyday stuff matters too. And so just take a few minutes here, moments here. I'll let you know um, when that time is up and we can share, but go ahead and reflect. And then when I give you the go ahead to start sharing, we'll popcorn around again and people who are online can feel free to share in the comments, but just take a couple deep breaths and root yourselves in these questions. What does freedom look like, smell like, taste like? feel like loving non-gentle non-judgment yes love and non-judgment safe for all yes i hear also a lot of laughter laughter yes it sounds like laughter Love that. Lots of music. All music. different kinds of music. Yes, music. In the chat, I see when everyone has access to all the resources they need. Yes. Yeah. 
I've had people, um, when I do this, I do this similar workshop for like all different kinds of people. And I've learned so much from you all from doing this. When I ask like youth groups or confirmation students, they'll be like, it smells like when, you know, my grandma is baking lasagna. That's what, that's what it smells like. Or it feels like running through the sprinkler with my cousins in the summer. Aww. Right? Some of those moments, these glimpses that we have of freedom um, that live in our bodies. Yeah. Does anyone else have some, some ideas? When everyone can be unapologetically themselves, authentic yes. everywhere. Yes, you can be unapologetically yourself, authentically everywhere. Lots of good, powerful words in that one. Where there is no hunger. No hunger. It feels like full bellies. Mm -hmm. It feels like children who in Center City can run around in the streets or their backyards and play without fear of mm -hmm. gun violence. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you all for, for doing that exercise with me and for your beautiful, beautiful, powerful answers. So these answers, um, some of them, you know, maybe you've had moments where you felt this way or you've experienced this. And maybe sometimes you haven't, or maybe sometimes some of the things we dream of, like everyone can be safe all the time and everyone can be themselves and be authentic and not have to be afraid. That can feel really different. It can feel, um, like impossible, making our collective reality align with that spiritual imagination we were just using um, is about building power. And some of us have really complicated relationships around words like power, and there's a lot to unpack there. But for now, like for the sake of this conversation, when I say the word power, I want you to think of the ability to make change. In the community organizing world, we say that power is organized people and organized relationships and resources. And so uh, our power resides in relationships. If power is the ability to make change, power is organized people, organized resources, then the building block of, the, of that power is relationships. And that's true of ministry too and our faith. We know that the Christian life is all about relationships. So here we have like some basic steps about making the dreams that we have a reality, capturing our spiritual imagination and helping those dreams and the dreams of God come true. And as you hear about some of this, maybe that you'll notice that there's parts of this, a lot of this that you've already been doing. Um, many of you might already be like really on the forefront or the edge of some of this work. Maybe not, maybe some of us are just getting started and just beginning to imagine what our role in all this would look like. And that's okay, that's great. I come from the Lutheran tradition, maybe many of you do. Uh, and I something I love about being Lutheran is that historically we have really, really valued things like education and ac academia. So I'm all about that. I'm getting my PhD, I have like opted into that stuff, right? And there's a pitfall with that because sometimes we end up sort of intellectualizing everything and we forget how to feel it. I used to really think about things like racism because I sort of thought they were important morally. Like it was the right philosophical thing to care about, but it really lived in my brain, like some kind of thought experiment. What really transformed me is when the reality of racism became very visceral to me and embodied. Instead of something abstract, I could just join a book club about, it was, it became the thing that kept me up at night. So now it's this like urgent feeling that I have when I think about ending white supremacy. I need to end white supremacy for the sake of my girls. And it feels now not like some abstract thought experiment, but that every cell in my body is really screaming for it. To access our spiritual imagination, we have to access our gut. We have to pay attention to what things break our hearts? What things feel so true to us that they could be carved on our bones? What are the things that keep us up at night? 
So I would love to hear for any of you, this is like a big vulnerable question. So don't feel like you have to answer. You can treat it as sort of a rhetorical question, but for those of you who have like a strong reaction or something that pops to mind right away and you wanna share, I would love to hear like, what are the sorts of things that keep you up at night? What are the things that feel so true to you that they're carved down your bones? What makes you angry or passionate? So you can put them uh, in the chat if you're online. If you're in person, feel free to, to pass the mic. But again, this is by invitation, not by force. So you can share as much or as little that makes sense to you. I have two things. One is uh, voter suppression. I really can't stand that that's going on in this country. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the burning of books. Yeah. of education. I mean, I just can't believe we're going back to the dark ages. But those are two things that burn within me. Oh, I might as well add the third one too. <laughs> <laughs> the third one is uh, seeing that all people, no matter what their sexuality is, is tr are treated equal. Mm -hmm. Having two gay sisters at, at Burns home with me. So those are my three things. <laughs> yes. And actually what we just uh, witness there is like something that's really true about accessing your gut. Like it, when you get in that place where you're like feeling it, that's a really creative, that fire in your belly is like a creative generative energy. So you might be starting off being like, yeah, voter suppression, it, that really matters to me. And then the gears start turning and there's more and there's more and there's connections and you really start to think things. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? I have one. Um, I work with, I'm a, uh, I work in early intervention, and so I work with young families with very young children um, to promote their development. Mm -hmm. and oftentimes, I am kind of supporting the family's journey through the medical community in Philadelphia, and the absolute um, racism that they face mm -hmm. advocating for the same medical treatments that my children receive without question, yeah. uh, the, the questions that they receive that I would never be at is just burns me up. Yes, medical racism is so real. Um, and it, it especially affects uh, black women in particular and girl children in particular. I had an activist um, say it to me once and I believe, I totally believe it. This is an activist I met in Ferguson. She now um, helps, she's on the board for some birth clinics that focus on black women, but she's a nurse and she said that the medical profession for black women is like what the police are for black men. And I thought that was a really like powerful metaphor of how really life or death, the way that medical racism really, really works. Thank you for sharing that. I also saw Pamela in the chat say, we don't take care of the world or the environment creation as we should. These are so great. We may, I have, maybe I have time for like one more person to share. I wish I could just sit and hear all of these forever actually, but. I have one. Yeah. It, it just rips my heart apart to think of a child hungry. Mm. Yes. And that is so disproportionate in our society today. Yes. I mean, no child should be hungry and we have the means that that should not be. Yeah. So, but we choose, we choose not to address that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. Like sharing, first of all, even like, like thinking about what is the stuff that keeps you up at night is like a really brave thing to do because like by nature of that question, it's stuff that like gets in your head. Right. And then sharing it is also very vulnerable. So thank you for that. Something that I really want to um, point out or to like have us all pay attention to is the reason that these things like mean so much to us that when we speak about them, our voice cracks or like we start feeling our heart pound or, you know, it's just like so in us um, is really connected to our own stories and experiences. It's so, like this, what, our first person who shared, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, but she shared about gender and sexuality and wanting liberation for all people, all people to be treated fairly. And she kind of mentioned like, I have a sister or a loved one that's gay. And like that, this really matters to me. And that was a really good example. Some of these things that we care about um, might have really obvious ties to our own story. Sometimes we have to peel back the layers a little bit to get to see like, huh, why does this get me so worked up, right? Um, but regardless, there is something in these things that's connected to who we are and what we've experienced. Something I love about abolition 
is that I think sometimes um, when we're working on building a better world, it feels like there's like a checklist of issues and it's like, oh yes, I'll work on this check, check. And you work on this check, check. And there's so many things that are wrong. And how, how do we even start? And what I love about abolition is it's not like another thing on the checklist um, because abolition again is about building the kind of world where everyone has what they need to thrive. So when you say things like, you know, ending medical racism, when you say things like, children not being hungry or gender equality, equality for people you know, of, of all sexual orientations, voting rights, all of those things are about building a better world where everyone has what they need to thrive. And so with an abolitionist lens and framework, all of those things can be abolition work as we're like building this better world together. Despite uh, what capitalism and maybe like white Western United States culture might tell us with this lie of rugged individualism, we actually can't build a new world on our own. God created us to be in community with one another on purpose. And so this is work that we do together. But we can't do this kind of work if we don't know each other deeply. This work is risky work. It takes a lot of courage. And so I don't want to be doing this kind of work when the person next to me doesn't know my story, doesn't know what keeps me up at night, isn't right there ready to be committed to me. And the only way um, that we get to know each other is by really sharing this stuff, doing that work of reflection of what matters to me and why, like how does that connect to my story? And then asking those same questions to our siblings and neighbors, asking about what keeps us up at night? What are our hurts? Why are we the way we are? And so when we ask each other those questions and we really listen, more often than not, we can find some common ground together. And that common ground is where we begin to build. When I dream of another world, when I start thinking of social change, my dreams are really big because they have to be. The things that I imagine are so completely radically different than our current reality that it can be kind of hard to figure out what to do about it. So sometimes we can get so overwhelmed by the bigness of our vision or so overwhelmed about where to start that we never get started at all. So in community organizing, what we do is we do this thing called slicing an issue. So if I dream about things like ending white supremacy, that's really big. That's not the sort of thing that like tomorrow I'll put on my planner, like to do and white supremacy. <laughs> um, it's, it's, too, it's too much. There's too many moving parts. So in sure. relationship with one another, because community discernment is huge, we figure out together, like, what is our piece of that? So for me, again, I want, I need an end to white supremacy. And then because of my story <clears throat> and the things that I witnessed in Ferguson, I feel, feel a special urgency around our criminal, criminal punishment system, ending prisons and policing, abolition. So when I came to Illinois, I met other people passionate about this same work. And I learned from communities and organizations what was already being done and where I could partner. So if I care about ending mass incarceration, again, that's not something that's like tomorrow, put in my planner, like on Tuesday and the mass incarceration, check, got that. So I had to discern along with communities and people who are most affected, people already doing this work, what is one piece that we can work on now? So in Illinois for the past eight years, and this is something I've only been a part of for the past four or so, we've been working on an end to the unjust practice of money bond, which is pretrial detention. So I don't wanna take up too much time talking about this because I could give a whole other workshop about money bond um, or bail sometimes, like that's very similar sort of idea. Um, money bond is where someone has been accused of a crime, but they haven't been committed, uh, they haven't been like, they haven't been found guilty of a crime, right? They've been accused of a crime and they've been arrested but they haven't been found guilty. Um, but because they are too poor, they cannot pay their way out to go home while awaiting trial. So in most cases, a judge will say, you know, bail is set at 5,000, bail is set at 10,000, bail is set at a quarter million, whatever. Um, and the judge has already decided that it is okay for this person to go home. It's okay for society. It's safe enough for everyone involved. But you only have that right if you can buy your way into it, right? And so it's almost like this ransom that keeps people held. And we know that people who are held pre-trial uh, 
are more likely to be found guilty because they have less time to work on their defense. They're more likely to lose their job, their housing, their children, right? And just perpetuates this cycle of harm and makes things better. So in Illinois, we were really working on ending this practice uh, of money bond. Jason Van Dyke, who's the white police officer who shot and killed Laquan McDonald, was convicted of murder and, and 16 counts of assault. Um, and while he awaited trial, he was able to buy his way out and wait for trial at home. Someone accused of murder, 16 counts of assault. But if you um, are Nicholas Lee and you have a charge, um, but no conviction, and you're too poor to pay your way out, you can be stuck in prison awaiting your trial. And for Nicholas Lee during COVID, that means he died of COVID. Oh. So ending money bond, I, I hope you can feel the urgency around ending money bond. And yet ending money bond doesn't end white supremacy. It doesn't even end ma mass incarceration, but it does put a major crack in the infrastructure, weakening it. And so this year, actually about a year ago, about a year ago now, um, Illinois became the first state to abolish money bond, which when it's fully rolled out next year, it'll make a direct difference in the lives of thousands and thousands of people. So any, ending money bond isn't the end goal for us. Like almost all the organizations that I worked with were explicitly abolitionist organizations, but it gets us closer in concrete ways. And so now we can cut our next slice and, and go for the next step. And it starts, by the way, with imagining this campaign that I worked on. I was part of an abolition think tank, which was made up of people from several organizations, activists, community leaders, social workers, pastors. And we spent hours just imagining and then using that to direct our way forward. In this work of building a new world, there is a lot of common pitfalls, things that hold us back. Um, I'm gonna go briefly over some of these and I would love for you to maybe kind of reflect and I'll ask you afterwards if there's one that like is really sticking out for you right now, like, whoa, yeah, that's me. Or like, yeah, that's my community or that's our church. This is a thing that we need to work on. Um, one of them is individualism. We sort of believe that we're out there on our own. We can try to lone wolf it and just kind of like muscle our way through. And those of us who are like lone wolf type people who try to be rock stars and do it all by ourselves, we might even get pretty far, but our work isn't sustainable and it falls apart without us. So that's one pitfall. Another pitfall is shallow relationships. Uh, a friend of mine in organizing said that just because I might buy my tomatoes at the same grocery store as someone else doesn't mean that we actually really have anything in common. And a lot of times, like we can apply that metaphor to churches. I know in the church that I grew up, I sat next to people in the pew every week and I couldn't even tell you you know, maybe even their names sometimes, uh, let alone what keeps them up at night, right? And so sometimes we really have these really shallow relationships with one another, which makes it hard for us to take strategic risks together, which leads to risk aversion, right? That's the next pitfall. We're afraid of what will happen. We're afraid of conflict. We're afraid of consequences. And we let these fears of doing the wrong thing or making the wrong choice keep us frozen. And we sort of forget that inaction is a choice itself and sometimes often even more costly. So there are costs when we take a risk, but there's also costs when we don't take a risk. There's costs to our integrity, our relationships. There's costs to our public witness as the church. There's costs for the gospel. But building relationships can really help with our risk aversion. It's really safer. It feels a lot safer to take risk if you're not out there on your own, if you know that the person next to you is truly in it with you. Next one is a uh, lack of an action reflection model. In Lutheran spaces, so often we kind of get stuck in like endless reflection where we endlessly journal or join book clubs and we don't necessarily take that knowledge to do something material in our lives, in our communities. So we are only taking like the time to reflect and we're not taking the time to leave our spiritual imagination um, to drive us to actually act. But there's also the inverse, right? There's some of us, and, and I struggle with this, I struggle with both of these, but I struggle with this one too. Some of us um, are so action driven that we don't make space to reflect, right? So some of us are like, we see something in the news and we're like, oh gosh, this is bad. 
I feel kind of guilty. I should do something about this. And we're out there kind of trying to earn our proverbial anti-racism scout badges by sort of frantically proving that we're good people by just like acting and joining every club and being at every protest, right? Um, obviously action is really good. And obviously reflection is really good, but when those are out of balance, it can really cause problems. If we're not reflecting on our action, then we're not leaving space for spiritual imagination to show us where to go next. And so the, the right model is done in community where together in community, we reflect and we decide where God is calling us next. And then we take the risk together in community to act. And then after we act, we get back together in community and we reflect, what is God saying? And then we take the risk again, right? And act. And so oftentimes that is out of balance. And then bitterness or burnout. I'm sure nobody ever has experienced this. <laughs> community organizing. Um, church people are like so burned out and your, I'm, your leaders, maybe not, maybe your leaders aren't burned out and they're just doing great. But um, <laughs> leader I know is really burned out. Like every council president, every pastor I know, every seminarian is like crying in the shower. So send them a Starbucks card or something. Um, in community organizing, there's a lot of times where we lose. And when we lose, it really hurts because again, these are things we put our whole hearts in. This is the stuff, again, that keeps us up tonight, up at night, and that's like connected to our own stories. And so when we lose, it really can break our hearts. It can make us doubt ourselves or our vision. This happens in communal organizing, it also happens in ministry. This is one of the reasons ministry is really hard. We don't always see the fruits of our labor. We might be teaching Sunday school for 20 years and we're like, oh my goodness, are these third graders hearing anything that I'm saying about God's love? And you have no idea, right? You don't know what's landing. And so that can be really, really, really hard. Um, and when we're burned out, we can, um, start to either take ourselves too seriously where we feel like if we don't do something or we don't do everything, it won't get done and we can kind of get frantic and overfunction. Um, or we can just be like frozen and like, I'm unable to move. I'm exhausted. Now I'm like, I have health issues. So I'm so stressed out. Right. So all of these pitfalls, um, I think are even more big right now during the pandemic, but I would love to just hear again, just like yell out, is there one that when I said, I explained this pitfall, you were like, oh my gosh, that's me. Or wow, that's our church right now. Or like, oof, that's, that's my small group or that's my family. Go ahead and either put in the chat or you can uh, pass the mic and let, it, let me know which one was it's just like super resonant right now. Uh could I just say something? Um, maybe this is an umbrella that knocks me nuts when I run into the mentality. Well, what can you do? Mm -hmm. This is to be expected. This is the way we are. And it, it just is like fingernails on a chalkboard. It, it just mm -hmm. makes me see crazy. Yeah. So kind of like apathy, right? Yeah. Like either giving up or being so cut off from our compassion that we like sort of stop caring. And that can be a protective measure or it can be a selfish measure. Or sometimes it's both. That's a big one. Sometimes, sometimes that comes from burnout. Sometimes it comes from just like being not connected with our own stories and our neighbors. But yeah, that's a big one. Thank you for sharing that. I always yell at myself then and just say, don't agonize, organize. <laughs> yes, yes. That's good. <laughs> Be a <laughs> I think that um, white churches in particular tend to be very, very risk averse. Mm. Yeah. Risk of, of difficult conversations, risk of losing people and the money that they bring and all of the things that um, create community and change around these issues also carry risk with them. And I think that we're not always good. And I include myself in this at taking those risks. Absolutely. And a lot of that, I love that you named white churches in particular, because a lot of that comes directly from white supremacy culture, because white supremacy culture, obviously the target is BIPOC people, people of color, but white supremacy culture hurts all of us and it limits all of us in different ways to different degrees. And one of the things white supremacy culture teaches us is that people are disposable. Um, and so, you know, we might hear sort of like, if you make a mistake, if you make a wrong move, if you make someone mad, like you're disposable and then what, right? Like you're worthless. And so it makes us afraid to take risks. It makes us, anytime that I, that's like one of the ways I've found to try to deal with that anxiety around risk 
is to be like, wow, this is like a lie from white supremacy. It's telling me that if I make a mistake or if I make someone mad that like I'm worthless and that's not true. But it's very, very, very prevalent in white churches. Absolutely. Thank you for naming that. I'm going to keep us going because I'm trying, you know, we, we got some time constraints, but your, all of your answers are so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Continue to think about this stuff. If you haven't noticed, a lot of the antidotes to some of those pitfalls is community. In community, we make time to reflect together. We make sure to care for one another. We allow people to take space or make space, step up or step back without everything falling apart. We can be risk, we can take risks and even be brave enough to lose because we know we won't be alone um, and we have people who have our back. And it's also important for us to remember that we are not cogs in a machine. We are not sort of scoreboards of records of wins or losses. We're human beings created in the image of God. Sometimes it's really easy to get so caught up in building the work of building a better world that we forget to notice the glimpse of those com that coming world all around us. There's all these times, right, where the kingdom of God is not yet, but it's also kind of here, but it's also kind of breaking in all at once. And so there are these moments where just for a second, the dreams that we have with our spiritual imagination have become a reality. Moments that kind of act like appetizers for us, for the feast to come. So we're really fortunate in the Christian tradition that we actually have a lot of these moments built into our liturgy. The sacraments in particular are full of imagination. In baptism, we have this moment where we proclaim that all people are members of God's family and no one is disposable and everyone can be made new. In Holy Communion, we unite with our spiritual ancestors from every time and place, the, the saints of history, past, present, future. Um, and we unite around a table and we proclaim a, a coming future where everyone is welcome and has their bellies full. These moments are built into our worship, but they also are in our everyday lives too. Full bellies around the table, laughing with loved ones, cheeks flushed, stories shared. These moments for us are inspiration and they fuel our spiritual imagination. They can be a part of what keeps us going. The church has a really special role to play in movements and community organizing. We say that churches are ready-made bases. Some of the hardest stuff is just to get a bunch of people in a room together. And with the church, we're really lucky that with the church, we gather regularly online or in person or hybrid. We gather regularly with people around a shared history, a shared story, and hopefully some shared values. And that's really special. Churches are also one of the few places in society that are truly intergenerational where you can build relationships with people um, across generations that aren't related to you. And within any given church, there's so many gifts. So I bet in your church, maybe you have like an engineer, a teacher, a parent, a retired nurse, right? Or some other like mix of different callings and vocations, parents, all that stuff. So each person has something to bring to our liberation movement, their passions, their gifts, their experiences, but also the church as a whole, like a full community, our identity together, we have a gift to bring too. Uh, the church's vocation as a whole can be to be a steward of spiritual imagination. When we are picturing a world of justice, it can be super hard to believe in. But luckily, those of us who are Christians have practiced believing in the impossible all the time. We gather together every week around this idea that God became a human and then like was killed but rose again. And like that's like our whole thing, right? Like we believe in the impossible. Our muscle of like believing impossible things is strong because we practice it every week. And so that's something that we can bring to the movement. We can kind of mine our narratives in scripture and even just like show the way of like, we can believe in impossible things. We can have hope for the future. We can believe that love wins. So, oops, sorry about that. So I wanna make sure um, that we have time here. Let me check the time. Good, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and I'm going to flash before I, I'm going to end this slideshow in a second here, just so that you can see my beautiful face because it's showered today for you. Um, but I, 
I wanted to flash this on the screen first in case, um, you know, in case you're interested in like a whole book of this stuff. The book Baptized in Tear Gas, I don't make any money off of this book. All of the money goes to Black liberation organizations, activists, bail funds, um, family, family members of loved ones who've lost people to state violence, money on the books for political prisoners. So you can get Baptized in Tear Gas uh, which is part theological reflection, part uh, at the end of each chapter, there's action items, reflection items, um, and it's part like kind of memoir, but you can find it anywhere that books are sold. If you're more of an ebook type person, like you like Kindle, it's on Kindle. If you are um, like a person who likes to listen to your books, it's on Audible and they even let me narrate it. They made me audition to narrate it. Usually they tell authors they can't narrate their books because we ruin them because we're writers, we're not voice <laughs> actors. <laughs> But they, they're like, no, there's professional people who do this. You should really let people who are voice actors do this. But they, they made me audition and then they let me do it. So um, if you are a person who likes to listen to your books, you can find it on Audible. And then again, I'm just flashing sort of my contact info on the screen. Or if you're interested in this kind of like content or these conversations, um, you know, you can find the silly video version, one minute videos of this kind of stuff on TikTok, or um, you can see my website, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff if you're into that. So thank you so much. I want to make sure that we have a little bit of time here for questions. So I'm going to end the sharing and then maybe we can, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat if you're online or in person, you can pass the mic a little bit. Uh, Pastor, before we go into that, I just want you all to know that you can find that you will be able to find that information on the Adult Forum, Adult Faith Formation website. Great. So you didn't get any of that down. Don't worry. Yes. Yeah. Pamela said in the chat, great question. Can you share a few ideas about how we can build community around these issues that keep us up at night? That's a really good question. So a lot of it is having one-to-one -one conversations with people and hearing more about like their dreams and how they feel and, and especially taking the risk to go deeper and say, yeah, why does that matter to you? Why, why are you concerned, um, you know, around hunger or, or why is it that this, this thing in particular bail bond is like really, really, really gets to you. Um, but also there's some ways like in the church that we can do this. We can have sort of create structures and containers for these conversations with small groups um, in Seoul before the pandemic, obviously the pandemic has changed this quite a bit, but in Seoul, the organization that I organized with here in Chicago, we say that any meeting that doesn't have food could have been an email. So I so I very much highly recommend um, when it's safe and makes sense and with your COVID protocols and all of that, but highly recommend gathering around food or, um, you know, in the summer when it's a little bit nicer out, like maybe around a fire with some hot cocoa or wine or lemonade or whatever your thing is and just really gathering, creating these containers where you're intentionally reflecting together and sharing your stories. Food is a big thing that brings people together, which is why one of the reasons communion is so powerful. It reminds us about that. Um, and then, you know, to find out have those conversations within your, your community so that you have that kind of trust. And then also to find out outside of your church, like who is doing this kind of work and what are they doing? In bigger cities like Chicago, you can Google like ending money bond and then you'll just like get a list of organizations. But if you're not in big cities, it's not usually like that. Sometimes it is, sometimes there's orgs and they're like, you just have to find them. But even in places like really rural areas or suburban areas where there might not be like 10 power organizations that you can partner with right away, there are always people who are doing this kind of work. Always, always, always. And sometimes it just looks a little bit different, right? So maybe um, in a really rural community, there's not like someone who's like, I am the um, executive director of a children's nonprofit for children's hunger, right? Like maybe you wouldn't see that um, in a really rural area. But what you might find is that teacher who keeps extra snacks in her desk. And when someone seems a little unfocused or sounds like they haven't had breakfast, hands over the granola bar, right? So sometimes we have to do a little bit extra digging, but even sometimes in those places, once you find each other, 
like you don't have some of the bureaucracy choking off the spiritual imagination, it can be even more powerful. Um, so I think in a church space, reflecting on scripture and our story and how it relates to what's going on out there can build community, gathering our food builds community, sharing our stories, connecting with people. It's really about building these containers where we can really start to learn about each other and trust one another. Are there other questions? I have one. Yeah. If you uh, have a, a church community such as ours, which mm -hmm. is very much connected and very relational on so many levels. That's awesome. How do we prioritize? Um, and in other words, not fall prey to, I want to do it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is, that is really hard, right? Because it's like, about slicing the issue. Like if it's like, we're already really close, we already really care about one another. And there's like a hundred things that we want to do and we're ready to go now. And so part of deciding when is it the right time to work on a particular issue, sometimes for shorthand, we'll call that a campaign, but it's not like an electoral campaign. It's just, it's just like a campaign. So it's deciding what campaign to work on or what campaign to build. Um, we kind of look at two different things. and. Out, this is outside of the sort of like pray and hear what God's calling you to, right? But sort of strategy wise, we look at two different things. We look at what is winnable and what is strategic. So um, L waking up tomorrow and ending white supremacy is not a winnable campaign. It's too big, right? And so we need to find something that's winnable, something that is small enough that there's like a clear outcome, there's clear goals, clear dates, and we can say yes. This is a winnable campaign because it's like a real tangible goal. On the, same on the same token, we want what we choose to be strategic. If we choose issues that are like so easy and non-controversial that like they're so winnable that everyone's like, yeah, they give everyone a dollar on Tuesday next week campaign. Hooray, we did it, right? Like, I mean, hey, a dollar's a dollar, but like, you know, if, if we choose, if we choose campaigns that are so winnable and so easy, then sometimes it's like, well, what do we really even do here? Right. And so that's something we work with intention is we need something to be strategic enough that it actually is big enough to crack open these systems that we're trying to dismantle. And we also need it to be winnable enough that we can actually get somewhere with it. And so the bail bond, uh, strategy, the bail bond issue campaign was like a really to me really good example of that because like it was a winnable campaign I know because we won it it took several years it took years and it's like it's still under threat right like there's every legislative session they threaten it right so but it was a winnable campaign and we know because we won it it took eight years and it was big enough it was a big enough deal it was risky enough that it's actually gonna make a huge, huge difference. At any given time, there's anywhere between, you know, 2,500 people in the Cook County Jail who are there because they're not committing, they haven't been convicted of any crime, but because they're just can't pay their way out. And so that makes a big deal. That is a big deal to empty out the jails like that. It's a big deal for those individuals and their families. It's a big deal, honestly, financially for the jail, which cracks that infrastructure. Um, so those are the two, obviously, you know, this is not like exactly a blueprint to do list, but those are two kind of guiding principles to hold intention is, are we in a moment right now where the spirit is moving and we're praying and there's a thing right in front of us that we could jump onto and is it winnable? And if we win, would it even matter? Right. And so kind of holding those things in tension. Thank you. That goes up against what can we do mentality. Yes, yes. I'll just say real quickly, Erin is passing out um, some examples of things that are relevant to our local and state issues in our local and state communities. Um, so as you hear Elle talk about what's winnable, what's strategic, um, what sorts of issues do we need to be tackling, we have some examples yeah. for you in our context um, going around the room right now. And those of you who are online, you'll have access to this on the Adult Forum webpage. Awesome. Can I ask one question? Please have time. Um, Maybe we could do one more if I actually keep it really brief in my answer. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so when we do advocacy work from within the church, one of the roadblocks can be a criticism that politics don't belong in church. Uh, yes. People want to come on Sunday and have respite from the world. What's your answer to that? And, and I, yeah, short and sweet, right? <laughs> right. Um, I even actually, gosh, I wish I had it pulled up. This is something that comes up so much that I wrote a blog post about it. So okay. that so that I can, um, which is on my website. So, you know, I guess we can find it later. But um, what I say is Jesus is not partisan. I think he would always be on the side of the most oppressed. And those people are typically rarely ever in office. And so, um, you know, all, all of our leaders, our job is to hold them accountable. But Jesus is not partisan. But Jesus was definitely political. The reason is, is because the word politics is just another word for how we order our public life together. So any decision that we make that affects the community is a political decision. And so Jesus cared a lot about community. Jesus cared a lot about the material reality of his community. That's why even as much as he was preaching and teaching, he was also healing people. He was feeding them. Feeding people is a political choice. Healing people is a political choice. It has political implications because it affects the community. So I think sometimes when people say politics don't belong in church, what they're actually saying is, I feel tense because we're talking about a controversial thing here. And um, that makes me not feel good, right? I think one check, this is not necessarily a, like a winning way to talk to this person, but one check for ourselves is, Many times marginalized people, when they hear stuff it, that my other people might think are politics and church, they do find rest and they are liberated because they feel validated, they feel seen, they feel like God is on their side, right? So if I preach a sermon about black liberation, maybe white people are like, yikes, that's politics. Anytime I preach those sermons, black people are like, yes, I feel seen. Yes, God cares about me, right? And so it does offer that rest and respite. And so maybe asking ourselves, why does it feel like um, this isn't good news to us? Why doesn't this feel like inspirational or comforting? Maybe it has to do with our own social location. And maybe there's people who do need to hear that. And are those the type of people that we wanna welcome and love? And we can love them by talking about the realities of their lives out loud and in public. And then like Jesus doing something about it. So again, that was a really short answer, but I know I was actually supposed to be done at 925. Um, so I want to make sure to hand it back over to Kathleen. And then I'm going to see if in like a minute here, I can put that link to that blog post in the chat. I don't have anything else, Dottie. Um, I do. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Thank you so much. You have given us motivation. You have given us ideas. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Pastor, could you just stay over a little bit just for some mechanics I need to work through? <laughs> Thank and thank you all for being here. Um, these conversations will certainly continue. I hope you all have lots of new, fresh ideas and motivation to continue having these conversations and doing this work. Um, and certainly the work is never done, but we're, we're working on it. Do you have anything for the good of the order from the advocacy team? Uh, no, just that the advocacy team welcomes all. And so if you feel particularly moved or um, want to know more, I would encourage you to join us and we will be advertising probably around March. And so we would love to see you either virtually or in person. Thank you if you're so moved and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.